All right, good morning, church. I know some of you must be tired because we had people that weren't as talkative during the class. So I know this may be carrying over to some of you here this morning. <coughs> Let's try this again. Good morning, church. Good morning. Right, that's right. All right. Glad you're here this morning. Uh, this is a busy time of year, and obviously this week is going to be busy also. I know some of you have got weddings and, and different things going on, and trips and vacations, and uh, I'd ask also that you would keep Mandy and I and the boys in your prayers. We're going to be going to Eastland on Wednesday, and I'll be speaking in their summer series, and so um, never been to Eastland, so this will be, be different, and so I'll pray for safe travels on that. I appreciate that. And we're going to be moving along here with this uh, series called Then Sings My Soul. We've been looking at how popular hymns that we sing in church services intersect with Scripture and seeing the relationship there, some of the themes that these hymns bring up, and talk a little bit about their background and how these songs came to be. I think, maybe this is just me, but isn't it frustrating when you need something and you can't get it for whatever reason or you you really need something or want something but you don't have access to it now the first thing i thought of was and, and maybe this has been some time for you in, in this regard but uh i thought of how you know when you're especially when you're younger maybe you need you really need money to pay the rent, right? Maybe you're a college student and, and you need money for this bill or that bill and you go to the ATM and it just says insufficient funds. That's not good, right? That's not a, that's not a good time of, of need where you're, you know, you can't have access to the thing that you need. Uh, I, so here's another one and you're going to laugh and think, well, that's not really a need, Aaron, but I would argue that maybe it is for me. Um, we were at the food truck championship last week and I mentioned that to you. I was standing in line for an ice cream and cookie food truck. That's all they do, ice cream and cookies. And they had all kinds of different things where you can just get ice cream with a cookie, or you can get a big thing of ice cream and stick it in between two cookies and make like an ice cream sandwich. And so they had all these different things. The line was really, really long, and I'm standing in this line. And just before I get to the front, there's a couple in front of me, husband and wife, and this man's wife orders chocolate chip cookies as part of her order. She's getting an ice cream sandwich, and she said, I don't know, vanilla, and I want chocolate chip cookies. And then the person working there at the food truck says, okay, that's the last chocolate chip cookie. We're out. And her husband was getting ready to order a chocolate chip cookie. And perhaps more importantly, I was about to order a chocolate chip cookie, and I get up there and I'm, I'm hearing this, and this guy is looking at me, and I said, man, there was just no remorse on that, was there? He said, no, she just took the last one, and, and I have to get something else now. So then I'm thinking, okay, now i got to get up there, and i got to choose something else, too. So that's not really a, uh, and I meant to show you this picture, but I don't want to get you too hungry. But, um, that, that may not classify as a need, okay? I get that. Maybe something that you can identify with a little bit better. You ever been driving, and you really needed to get some gas and there is not a convenience store anywhere close ever been in that situation you need something but you just can't get it you don't have access to it sometimes this will happen at our house too where baby is making dinner and and she'll you know call me or text me and i'll, or I'll text her and say hey what are we having for dinner and she'll say enchiladas hey that sounds good all right sounds good to me and then a few minutes later, she'll text me and she'll go, oh, yeah, by the way, um, could you pick up some tortillas on the way home from the store, right? Which is kind of needed for enchiladas. Sometimes that happens where we, we have certain things in front of us. I need this or I want this. I just don't have it. And it's really, really sad. Obviously, these are all physical forms of this, uh, earthly forms of this. But it's sad when we know the need. We know how to feel the need. We just can't take care of it. We don't have access to it. We're going to be talking about 
on a, on a greater scale than, than these things, obviously, than ice cream and cookies or gas or anything like that, we're going to be talking about this need that every single person has, whether they recognize it or not. And that is the need for God's grace. Every single one of us need it. And the good thing is, everybody has access to it. We know where to find it. So we're going to be talking about this idea of grace. We're going to look at Paul's example. And we're also going to look at, to go along with this series, we're going to look at a famous hymn, you know it, the song Amazing Grace. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at this passage of Scripture where Paul is telling Timothy kind of his past, who he is now in Christ. So in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he starts there in verse 12. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, saying here's who I used to be. Yet, I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant. And take note of that. We're going to come back to what this means in the Greek. This idea of grace being more than abundant. He says, with the faith and the love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason, I found mercy so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who believe in him for eternal life. In other words, Paul's saying, if God can save me and in his patience lead me to salvation, then anybody can be reached. Verse 17, now that the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So here's the idea I want us to think about this morning, is that God's grace is not needed by all, but the good news is it's available for all. The thing that we need the most in our relationship with God, we have access to. We're able to get the grace that we need. And so we're going to be looking at this idea of grace through the lens of a song that we have sung, no doubt, hundreds of times, thousands of times. If you grew up in the church, you might be getting close to a million times on the ticker. We've, we've sang this a lot, Amazing Grace. And it's written by a guy named John Newton. And this song has been uh, obviously immensely popular over the last several hundred years. It is a song that has been sung by slaves in the American South. It was a chart-topping hit in the 60s. It was sung by Johnny Cash whenever he went and would visit prisons. And it's also played very creepily on bagpipes if you've ever been to a state procession. This is a very, very popular song. So the story of John Newton is he was not always a believer. And he was kind of a rebel. He got into trouble a lot. He was pressed into service with the Navy. He didn't want to go, but he was made to go. And so he was in the, in the Navy, and he was going through these things where he was sometimes beaten uh, for kind of being a bad boy. He was doing things that maybe he shouldn't do. And so the Navy had a way of making sure that keeping him in line and, and punishing him for that. And so he didn't have this great background. And at one point in his life, he comes across a devotional book that was entitled The Imitation of Christ. And he just simply reads through it, browses through this book. But he starts thinking, what if these things are true? What if these things that I'm reading about are actually true? And there is a God. And there is a spiritual world. And there is such a thing as condemnation and salvation. So he starts thinking about this. And he kind of files it away. It worries him a little bit. But he moves on. And then in March of 1748, he's on this ship called the Greyhound. And everybody on this ship, at one point, they come through this storm. It's several days uh, in, in duration. This storm is beating the boat up. The ship is being tossed to and fro. There's this great fear that they, it's going to capsize, and everybody on this ship is going to lose their life. It's pretty scary. And at one point, John Newton he recounts that 
he's standing there on the ship, and there's a man just a few yards ahead of him, standing by the edge of the ship, and the waves come by and just sweep this guy right off the edge of the ship. Just take him right off. And he noted, I was standing there just a few minutes ago. That could have been me. And in this book, The Imitation of Christ that he had read, there's a, an excerpt about begging God, pleading to God for mercy. And he, re he recalled that in his mind. And he said, I don't know if I'm going to get out of here, but he says, God, if you get me out of here, I beg for your mercy that you spare my life, and if you get me out of this, I will live for you. I will change. And this has been a, a very popular story. This is a uh, glass stained um, window in a church in Ireland close to where the Greyhound was, was sailing. And so this is a very familiar story that's been passed down. And John Newton, he does survive. He gets off the ship. He goes on to become a minister. And it is during this time that he starts writing a hymn book. And what originally started was he was he told himself when he was preaching or giving a lesson, he said, I'm trying, I'm gonna write a hymn every time I give a lesson, and I'll use that as my illustration. And so at one point he writes a song called Faith's Review and Expectation. We call that song Amazing Grace. Faith's Review and Expectation didn't really roll off the tongue quite as well. Faith review and expectation. And they eventually changed the name to Amazing Grace because those are the two words that the song starts with. But he originally writes the song as an illustration for one of his sermons. And over time, it's included in a hymn book called Only's Hymn Book, along with hundreds of others. And that's it. It kind of is just there, and it takes some time to pick up some steam. But then when it does, and people recognize it, it becomes very, very popular. And we're familiar with this idea of this song, familiar with the verses of this song. He starts off in the, in the song with this, these words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And it's interesting that this is a very autobiographical song because he's writing about himself. That saved a wretch like me. It's the same thing that we just read looking at Paul's life. In fact, if you're here on Wednesday nights, we've been looking at Romans, and in Romans chapter 7, we looked at that idea where Paul says, who's going to save me from this body of sin and death? He says, wretched man that I am. Paul understands he is a wretch. John Newton understood that as well and recognized that. We see a lot of uh, undertones here, other parts of Scripture. He says, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I don't know about you, that immediately takes me to the prodigal son. Uh, was blind, but now I see. Reminded of the story of Jesus healing the blind man in John chapter 9. And so we see these themes. It, this song took a lot of different forms over the years. Eventually a guy comes along and he, uh, has, he puts it to this shape note format, which is called New Britain. And from there on, the song has pretty much been unchanged. Uh, it's had that tune and had that melody for it. Now, one of the things that you may not know about this song, Amazing Grace, we sing this a lot. John Newton didn't actually write the last verse. There was a woman named uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and she is, I don't know if you will recognize this name, she is the one who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. So she's very much against the, this anti-slavery anti -slavery thing that's going on. We'll see here a little bit. John Newton gets involved in this as well. But he writes the, the first few stanzas, some of which, just like our song last week, are not included in our songbooks. But he writes this song, and then Harriet Beecher Stowe comes along later, and she adds lyrics that were in another songbook that some of the slaves sang. That had been passed down orally. It was a tradition and they knew this verse, but it had not been committed to, to books yet. And so Harriet Beecher Stowe comes along, and she takes those words from this other hymn and adds them to John Newton's work. So she's responsible for this verse. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And so this story points out this universal need that each and every one of us have. We cannot 
do it ourselves. We have to be saved through God's grace. It is something that we all need, and thankfully it's something that we all have access to. So Paul uses a phrase when he talks about him, himself, when he talks about this grace that is there, that is abundant. It's a, it's a word that means super abounding grace. There's grace, and there's this version that Paul's talking about here in 1 Timothy 1. He says it's a super abounding grace. And it's the only time in Scripture that this word, this form of this word, is used. Paul is saying this is what it took. To save someone like me. This is the grace of God and how it's intersected with my life. Now when you go back and you look at Paul's view of himself, his estimation of himself as he pours this out in his writings. So in 1 Corinthians 15 we see this idea. He says to, about himself, I am the least of the apostles. The least of the apostles not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Okay? After that, 1 Corinthians is written before Ephesians. So after that, he writes Ephesians. Years later, he says this. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. And then here in 1 Timothy, he says, Jesus came to the world to save sinners, and I'm the worst one. Some versions say, I'm the chief sinner, foremost sinner. So when you look at his progression, the older Paul gets, the less he thinks about himself. You notice that? So he starts off saying, I am the least of the apostles. Okay, so just this group of apostles, he says, okay, I'm an apostle, but I'm the least of those guys. And then he says in Ephesians, I'm the very least of all the saints. So now he's not just the least of the apostles, but the least of everybody in the church. And then when he gets to where he writes 1 Timothy, he says, I am the foremost or the chief of sinners. I think it's important that the more Paul reflected on his life, the more he realized his reliance on God's grace. He understands it's only because of God's grace that I am in the position that I am in. He thinks worse of himself as he goes along. And yet, he says, God saved me. And so Paul is reliant on God's grace. In Ephesians chapter 2, he talks about this grace. Another passage where he talks about it. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. Again, this idea, you and I cannot do anything to earn this. We're simply not good enough. It is only through the grace of God that we have this relationship with Jesus. And so you see that it is needed. It is absolutely needed. It says we have been saved through faith. Anyone that wants salvation, anyone who wants to be saved, they have to come through the door of grace. This is how we access the salvation. And then the Titus, he simply says, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. So there you see the need for everyone, but you also see the access for everyone. Bringing salvation to all men. Something we all need. And he says, to all men. So it is a good thing. It is a good gift. But I think it's important that we share this with people and let them understand. Yes, you need God's grace, but the good news is you can have it. It's available to you. You have access to it. One other thing that's interesting about John Newton, you go back and look at his timeline and some of the things that he was involved in. So he has this encounter on the Greyhound ship. His life is spared, and he goes and he writes Amazing Grace. Now what's interesting is he has this encounter in March 1748. He does not actually stop being a slave ship captain until six years later. Think about that. This guy, this is his background. He runs a slave ship. He is a captain of a slave ship. And even after this 
life-changing event where he says, God, if you let me off this boat, I will serve you. I'll, I'll do whatever you want. Just show me your mercy. Even after God does that, he still is sailing as a captain of a slave ship for six more years. Then, he eventually leaves. He's not going to be a captain of a slave ship anymore. And then he goes and becomes a minister. And in 1779, he writes this song, Amazing Grace. And then about one year later, he starts fighting <coughs> against slavery in England. And he fights, and he fights, and he fights, and he fights, and he gets down to nearly his dying breath before his dream of slavery being illegal comes true. So in 1807, in March of 1807, there's an anti-slavery bill that passes. It was first uh, voted in in 1804, and he wondered if he would ever see the day where it would actually be made law, and if he would live to see it, and he barely does. In March of 1807, they passed this anti-slavery bill. This is something he had fought for for the last 20, 30 years of his life. And in December of 1807, he passes away. Well, what I want you to see is that you go through his timeline and look at it, even though he has these things where he becomes a Christian and God saves him from these moments, he's still not completely changed. And then it takes him quite a while before he realizes, here's what I should be doing. Here's the cause I should be fighting for. John Newton is quoted as saying, I cannot consider myself to have been a believer in the full sense of the word, word until a considerable time afterwards. End quote. So what he's saying is, yes, I was converted. Yes, I became a Christian. But I wasn't a, a Christian in the full sense of the word. In other words, it took him some time before he started living the way that he knew he should have been all along. Now, what is the point of that? Some of you have become Christians. Some of you have been baptized. Some of you have been in the church for a long time. And maybe you have not been doing what you know you need to be doing. And I want to encourage you with the thought that it is not too late. John Newton converts to Christianity and he still is a captain of a slave for six more years. And then he goes and he writes this wonderful song, Amazing Grace, which is wonderful and great, but he doesn't actually understand how to put that into practice. And then in the last stages of his life, he finds something to fight for. So let me encourage you, whether you, if you've been a Christian for five years or 50 years, it's not too late to go out and do what God has empowered you to do. So let me give you a few things as far as application. Very first and foremost, we should be thankful people. We should be able to thank God for His amazing grace. This is what allows us to have a relationship with God. And so we need to be thankful for that. We need to show our thanks for that. And to take a, a page out of Paul's story and also John Newton's story, I think it's good for us to share our story of how God's grace has reached us. John Newton does this in the song. But he also goes on and does it later on in his life. Paul mentions it here in other places. He says God's grace was, he says, this super abundant grace. And because of that, I was able to go out and preach and teach to other people. It is God's grace that allowed him to go out and minister to other people. We all have a story. And Paul says, it was, I was used as an example. If God is patient with me, if God can save me, then he can save you. And your story is different than mine. And my, different, my story is different than yours. You have a story. You have a unique story where you can say, Here's where I was, like Paul, and here's where I am now, and here's where grace came in the picture. Here's where grace entered my life. Here's how I became a Christian. We all have that story, and I'm going to encourage you, for those people in your life, your friends, your family, your neighbors, your coworkers, you may not be able to just come right out and say, here, let me tell you my story of how I became a Christian. But you see those moments during the week. You have those times where you can tell people, here is the difference in my life. God's grace. And again, important for us to remember, it's not too late to be better. 
It's not too late to do better, to live better. We can see in John Newton's life, even when we become Christians, sometimes it takes us, it takes some of us a little while to get going and realize our purpose. And if you're in that boat, I hope you can understand it's not too late that you can start getting involved and start doing what God wants you to do. And so this grace oh. is needed by all. Oh. It's available for all. And it is truly amazing. And so I'm going to ask you if it's convenient for you. If not, that's fine. But if it's convenient for you, if you'll be standing, and Joe will lead us in this song, Amazing Grace. <laughs> 